Welcome to today's webinar, Trains, Buses, People, an Atlas of U.S. and Canadian Transit, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the U.S. EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speaker in this webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Trains, Buses, People, an Atlas of U.S. and Canadian Transit. You can also search for event number 922-6236. I'd like to acknowledge our webinar partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. So today we are welcoming back Christoph Spieler. Christoph is Vice President and Director of Planning at Huit Zolars in Houston and a senior lecturer at Rice University. At Huit Zolars, he has completed a variety of land use and transportation plans in Texas, as well as in Seattle and St. Paul, Minnesota. He was a member of the board of directors of Houston's Metropolitan Transit Authority of Harris County, known as Metro, from 2010 to 2018. As the chair of Metro's strategic planning committee, he initiated a transit system reimagining process. Christoph has written and spoken extensively on transit and urban planning. He teaches courses in architecture and civil engineering at Rice University. As a member of the American Public Transit Association Sustainability and Urban Design Working Group, he has helped to draft national standards on transit and urban design. He is also a contributor to NACTO's Transit Street Design Guide and a board member at Transit Center in New York. Following his presentation, Christoph will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. So to get started, we're gonna take a couple quick polls as we often do, including the first one, which is just asking everybody in the audience today where you live or work, and you have the options on your screen. Uh, if you're having any trouble responding to the polls, you may need to exit from full screen mode. And it is possible that you may need to refresh your screen during the presentation itself. We occasionally have problems with that, and that's something that you might need to do. So we'll give you a couple of minutes, well, not a couple of minutes, actually, a couple seconds here, more seconds, to respond to this. You can see the votes coming in, and then we'll share that information and then ask you one other poll question before turning it over to Christoph. And thank you for participating today. Okay, so in our audience today, 36% are reporting to be in the Mid-Atlantic or Northeast, 21% in the West, 18 Midwest, 17% South, and 8% International. Our second question here for you today, relevant to the topic, is when is the last time that you rode transit? And you have five options here. You can select one today, this week, this month, earlier this year, or a long time ago. And again, we'll give you about 30 seconds or so to respond. 
we'll share the results and then we'll turn it over to Christoph. Recognizing that in the pandemic, um, certain travel patterns have changed. So interesting to see what people are saying. And the preliminary results are interesting as well. Give you a couple more seconds to respond here. And then we'll share. Okay, so of the respondents, 30% says early, I say earlier this year, 27% a long time ago, 17% this month, 16% this week, and 11% road transit today. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to Christoph. Welcome, Christoph. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, let me, there we go, show this window. Okay, I, I'm very happy to be here. It, it's it's interesting in in this virtual world that um, I am virtually in Maryland today, even though I'm actually in Houston. But as we saw from the polls, we also have have viewers. Um, we also have viewers here from all over um, the United States and apparently all over the world. So uh, I'll make some Maryland specific comments here along the way, but. Um, I'm also very happy in the Q&A to, to dig into a lot of other areas. Um, and I am here today to talk about trains, buses, people, and opinionated atlas of US transit. Um, so really this book, um, now the second edition, um, came from my own experience. I care about transit because I love great cities and I think transit makes more, more vibrant cities. It, it makes for better places to live. And if we do transit right, we can make people's lives better every day. Um, here you can actually see my own life, um, the place where I live, the building where I am at my office right now at Hewitt Zollers and the train that takes you from one to another. And, and that train makes my life easier every day. And I love seeing from the poll questions how many transit riders we have in the audience today so so hopefully you have that same kind of experience and really we would be a better world if more people had the ability to to access that kind of high quality transit so what the book does is it covers every metropolitan area with rail or brt um, and for each of them calls out the statistics of the systems that they have, maps the transit infrastructure that region has all to the same scale, so you can easily compare city to city, um, maps the demographics of that area and the frequent transit networks in that area, so you can see how well the networks serve that, and then tells the story of each city, what kind of transit it has built, why it made those decisions and how it's working. And as the subtitle says, this is an opinionated atlas. I think it's important to note some places have done very well here and some places haven't. Um, and, and I try to be honest about that in the book. Um, the first edition covered the United States. The second edition now covers the United States and Canada. So that's 57 different metro areas all the way from the New York cities and Toronto's of the world um, down to places like Winnipeg and Kitchener and Fort Collins. Um, also includes San Juan, Puerto Rico. In this edition, uh, I've worked with Remix to get additional data. Um, so that helped me sort out the frequent transit networks for each of these cities. The book maps all bus and rail routes that run at least every 15 minutes um, from morning to evening. Um, and that Remix data has also allowed me to, to have more stats comparing the different cities together. At the beginning of the book, there's a section which talks about how transit works, new material this time around on things like fares and transit alignments, and a section on what makes successful transit. Um, and that is where I want to start with. Um, what actually makes transit that is useful to lots of people and therefore has high ridership? And we start with density. Effective transit is transit that serves places where lots of people are. So if we want to make high ridership transit, we build it where people are, and then we find opportunities for more people to move to the places where that transit already is. Secondly, 
High ridership transit serves multiple activity centers. Um, here you can see Houston and the connection between downtown and the medical center, which is what makes that one of the highest ridership light rail lines in the United States. Um, high ridership transit connects multiple centers together and serves all sorts of different kinds of trips. High ridership transit is walkable. If you look at the United States, you will not find a high ridership transit system that depends mainly on park and ride. The, the high ridership systems are those where lots of people can get there by walking to the train or to the bus. Um, and of course, Every transit rider, even if they park and ride on one end, is a pedestrian or a bicyclist on the other end of their trip. Um, so good transit systems are walkable. High ridership transit systems are also connected. They're not just one individual rail line or one individual BRT line. Um, they are connected networks with lots of opportunities to transfer from bus to rail and rail to rail in a way that opens up an entire city, an entire metropolitan area. High ridership transit networks are frequent. Um, we all know what it feels like to ride an hourly bus and have the choice of um, being uh, five minutes late or 55 minutes early. Um, we can see very dramatically that frequent service causes more people to ride because it makes transit more useful. It means the transit is there when you need it, um, rather than you having to plan your life around that transit. Um, high ridership transit provides competitive door-to-door -door travel times. I'm not saying anything about the top speed of the trains. The question is how long does it take you to get from your origin to your destination, which means we have to think about the walking time, we have to think about the waiting time, and we have to think about the travel time. And equally importantly, high ridership transit is reliable. Um, because getting you there when it promises to get you there is so essential. This is what causes people to lose a job. If they show up late to work every day, they don't have that job anymore. Um, so we need transit to be reliable. Successful transit provides the capacity that it needs. Um, it can carry lots of people. And this is one of the real strengths of transit is it's a better use of urban space than anything else other than walking or biking. And high ridership transit is legible. Um, I like this picture. You can basically see everything you need to know, where the train is going, your final destination, how to get from one to the other. A, a good transit network is one that's easy to understand for people who are using it for the first time or for people who make a different trip every day. And finally, something that I made sure to add to this edition of the book, good transit is inclusive. Good transit welcomes everybody. Uh, and, and that means it welcomes you regardless of your race, which means we need to think about um, all sort of the history of inequity our cities are based on um, and, and how to affirmatively counteract that. Um, good transit welcomes you whether you are in a wheelchair or not, good transit welcomes you, whether you are traveling with kids and pushing a stroller or not. So the more we make everybody feel welcome on transit, the more everybody will use it. So what's interesting about this is that if you're a transit rider, you actually know all of these things. And to me, one of the basic theses of this book is this is not actually that hard. Um, these are very simple, basic things. The other thing I think it's worth pointing out in 2021 is that these things have not changed due to a pandemic. Um, I, I think we've seen over the course of the last 18 months that transit agencies have actually done a really good job of figuring out how to operate transit in the midst of COVID. Um, COVID doesn't change the fundamental ge geometry of transit. Um, it still moves more people in less space um, than single occupant vehicles. And so the need for transit is still there. Um, COVID has not changed the fundamental geography of cities where the activity centers are is no different than it was before COVID. Um, nor has COVID changed the inequalities in our systems. Uh, the problems we were facing before are still there and we still have to take them seriously. Um, COVID obviously has done nothing to resolve the issue of climate change and, and the urgency of finding a way to live with lower carbon footprints. And 
everybody who has studied this seriously has concluded that has to involve more people riding transit, walking and biking. It is not just about electrification of single occupant vehicles. Um, and COVID doesn't change the need for transit. We saw all through this that essential workers were still riding this. Transit was keeping our cities running. Those doctors and the nurses at those overwhelmed emergency rooms were getting there on transit. Um, the people who kept the pharmacies and the stores running were getting there on transit. And we have seen that COVID really hasn't changed the public's mind on transit. And in the midst of all of this, we've been seeing cities pass bond measures, we've been seeing strong public support for continuing to expand and improve transit systems. I would also say that COVID has reminded us of some basic things. Um, that the systems that most saw their ridership drop off were systems which are really targeted to very specific travel markets. And I, I would say that Maybe we shouldn't design entire networks simply around white collar commuters heading downtown. The more a transit line serves lots of people making lots of different kinds of trips, the more useful it is and the more that ridership held up during COVID. Those lines were never that efficient to start with. Um, they're even more inefficient now. And, and I think there's an opportunity there to rethink how they function. COVID has also reminded us that we should take better care of transit workers. Bus operators, train operators became frontline workers in the midst of a pandemic. And, and we had a very sad number of, of transit employees actually die due to this. I did, New York City did a very moving memorial here. But the fact is, I think we've taken bus operators and train operators and mechanics for granted for a long time. And we should be thinking about how do we make better working conditions? So the really basic thing, shouldn't, shouldn't the end of every bus route have a restroom so that that operator um, can meet their basic human needs. Um, so hopefully we come out of this taking the needs of the people who run our transit systems more seriously. Um, and I would say in a very fundamental way, COVID has reminded me, hopefully reminded a lot of us that, that we can't take transit for granted. Um, we saw agencies have to make drastic cuts in service. We saw doomsday scenarios if, if transit funding didn't come through. We need transit um, and we can't just assume it will always be there. Um, we need to make sure that it will always be there um, by advocating for better transit. Um, so I'm coming out of COVID feeling even more urgency about all of this. Um, but part of that urgency that I feel and which I really talked about a, a lot the last time I was here is that oftentimes we haven't been very good at this. If, if you look at the transit systems we built and, and ask how useful are they, what kind of ridership are they getting, um, we're seeing real shortcomings. And I'd say there's a lot of reasons for this. One is that we talk way too much about modes. I am sick and tired of having train versus bus discussions. Um, we um, hurry through some of the most important decisions we make, like the, the larger system planning. Um, we don't think about networks. We think about buses and trains individual. We, like I said earlier, plan single purpose transit, transit lines that are designed to serve only one trip, like this train in New Jersey designed to serve white collar commuters commuting to nine to five jobs in Manhattan, even though it passes through areas where there are a lot of different kinds of travel needs. Um, I don't think we take data seriously enough. Um, I think often we are looking at too large a scale. We're building these big regional projects that look impressive on a map, but don't necessarily serve lots of people. Um, we are thinking about paths and not destinations. Uh, we're thinking about where is the easiest place to build a train rather than where are people actually going to and how do we get stations in the middle of that. And I would say off, way too often we avoid opposition. Um, the way I put this sometimes is that um, if nobody is against your transit project, it may well be a bad project um, because good transit goes in the middle of where people want to go. And that means we actually need to work through the fact that change is hard. So that's what we're doing wrong. Um, but I thought, especially with this edition of the book, it's worth talking about what we can do right. How do we actually create better transit so that people have access to everything they need in life? And I would say in city after city, 
it starts in a very simple place. We need frequent networks. We need all day show up and go service serving as many people as possible. We need to give as many people as possible the opportunity app to transit that's there when they need it rather than something they have to plan their lives around. It makes such a big difference um, in terms of trip time um, and in terms of the overall experience of using transit. But across the United States, we have a lot of people who are having to make do with that infrequent transit service. Um, here is from the book, a map of the frequent transit footprint of all of the metro areas in the book, the, the white colored areas, places that have transit at least 15 minutes from about 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and the variety and how different metropolitan areas have done here is huge. I wanna underline, I'm talking metropolitan areas here, not transit agencies. And most of these cases, there are multiple agencies across that area. And sometimes the, the sort of disconnects between agencies are actually some of our biggest problems. Um, so these are problems that need to be solved at the level of a metropolitan area. And a lot of this is about funding, which means it's not actually the transit agency leadership that's making the key decisions. Um, but you can really see the range here. At the top um, in North America is Vancouver. 66% of people in the Vancouver metropolitan area are within walking distance of frequent transit. And it's notable how much better Vancouver is doing than others. This is New York City, 43%. We think of this rightly so as, as the best transit network in the United States and definitely the highest ridership. But you look at this map and you see how many gaps there are. And those gaps are not in New York City. Those gaps are in the suburbs. If you go into New Jersey, if you go, um, north, if you go out onto Long Island, there's a lot of very dense areas that don't have that frequent transit service of so infrequent commuter rail, infrequent local bus service. Um, so you can see what kind of opportunities we have there. Um, and interestingly, some of the cities that are doing well are not cities that actually have land use patterns that are well served, to, that are well suited to transit. San Diego, Sunbelt City, a lot of post-World War II growth, but a transit agency, which is really focused on getting frequent service on the ground and a very similar story in Salt Lake City. Um, Los Angeles, you can see um, a lot of the city of Los Angeles and LA County, but as you get out into Orange County, for example, as you get out um, towards San Bernardino, um, you see that network really drop off. Only about 22% of residents in the metro area within walking distance. Um, San Francisco Bay Area at 17%, a very familiar pattern. You can see sort of the pre-World pre War II or urban cores are served well, but essentially what you're seeing here is a transit network that hasn't evolved much beyond that, where the frequent service in a lot of ways is still where the frequent service was in 1940, even though the area has changed a lot. Um, and the DC Baltimore region is actually also at 17%. It's interesting, the Baltimore end of the region is actually doing much better than the DC end. And especially if you look at the DC suburbs, you can see some really big holes in that frequent network. Um, Houston, after we redesigned the bus network at 16%, um, Boston at only 14. And again, you can see some of those real gaps in frequent service. This will get better. I'm actually um, working with the MBTA right now, advising them on a, on a very ambitious bus network redesign. So hopefully that number will look a lot better soon. Um, Phoenix, 14%. Um, El Paso, definitely punching above its weight at 13% here. And then there are some areas which are very much towards the bottom. Um, when I ran the stats for the book, Dallas-Fort Worth area was at 3%, a place that has built a lot of transit, but not really provided a lot of service. As you can see on this map, Fort Worth was actually outdoing Dallas. Um, and that is still the case. We actually um, helped Fort Worth redesign their transit network that just got implemented. Dallas is also doing a redesign. Um, and so you will see that number get better. The other thing that really stands out in the book is how well Canada does at this. Um, every Canadian metro area is outperforming its peer. Here's um, transit ridership by metro area ranked in order of population. You can see the outsized ridership in New York City. But as you go down, notice the Torontos of the world, roughly the same size as Atlanta or Seattle, but many times the ridership. And that's true for all of these Canadian cities. And so why does Canada do so well? 
first of all, they have really good frequent network footprints. Um, this is the city of Toronto, and, and you can see how much of the city itself is basically entirely covered. Um, but you can also see some really good frequent transit service outside city limits in, in what are quite suburban areas. What's interesting here is Canadian land use patterns don't look that different from US patterns. Um, but the ridership is dramatically better. And that extends beyond just frequent service. Um, Canadian cities tend to have really good coverage of half hourly and hourly transit service. Um, and this means that we really have to think about service. We, we spend way too much time talking about how we fund capital projects, but how we pay for operations, how we can increase our operating budgets year in and year out is equally important, probably more important in terms of getting better transit ridership. Next, once you have that frequent service, we need to get it out of traffic. We need reliable high capacity lines in the highest ridership corridors that are not stuck in traffic. Um, if you've ridden buses, if you've ridden streetcars, you know the experience of, of being stuck at a red light in a long queue of cars. Um, and you know what that does to tra transit travel time and reliability. We're starting to see some cities do some really good things here. We've got things like busways in New York. We've got a really big scale of implementations of bus lanes across San Francisco. Um, and we're seeing more and more places do what's really the gold standard of dedicated transit lanes, which is median running lanes, um, places where parking, driveways, right turns, do not interact with the transit lane, and we can really provide a lot of reliability here. You're seeing this in places like suburban San Diego. You're seeing some really great work in Indianapolis where they managed to build seven and a half miles of, of dedicated lanes um, on their red line in very quickly and quite cost effectively, largely by repurposing existing streets rather than rebuilding them, actually taking lanes away from cars. And I would say if Indianapolis can do that, you can think about that's really something a lot of places should be able to pull off. CBRT in Oakland, California, the Tempo Project. Um, and you can see some larger cities really sort of treating these as feeder systems. Um, Montreal, for example, building BRT, that will feed into the metro lines. And that gets to the next point. Um, we really need to create the spines for the network. And to me, that's what rail and BRT do. An effective transit network uses rail lines and BRT lines to really be the backbones of the network, the, the things that connect everything together. Here's Boston, for example. Um, the thick lines here are rapid transit um, and the thin lines are bus routes and they are color coded um, by which rapid transit lines they feed into. So all of those red lines all feed into the red line. And what you can see here is how Boston has essentially created this, this network of tributaries, which means each of these rapid transit lines benefit far more people than simply the people who are immediately around the stations. This means, as I said earlier, that we really need to focus on those big decisions. Where do we actually put transit? Which corridors are we going to focus on? Because generally, that's a much more important decision than which alignment we use within that corridor. And you can see how that philosophy has really shifted over time, that um, pre-World War II, um, the major transit lines were built within the dense walkable urban cores, closely spaced stations. Um, and then you look at the post-war systems, things like Atlanta here, um, where there were systems built to get people from the suburbs to downtown as quickly as possible. Um, much more widely say stations, much more focus on park and ride, many fewer stations in that walkable urban core. And when you started to see light rail systems being built in the, the 80s and 90s, you saw much the same pattern. Uh, the downtown segment may have been running on a street instead of in a subway. But the basic idea of, of getting out to the suburbs as quickly as possible and basing those systems on park and ride stayed the same. Um, if you are looking around the country now, you are seeing more and more cities really take a more integrated approach um, where they are building that BRT and rail in walkable neighborhoods, often focusing on lower income neighborhoods, which actually have very high transit demand. Um, and seeing those transit lines as an integrated part of a bus rail network, which 
it's really important to actually think through the philosophy of how we do this. You see some cities do what you can see here on the left, which is essentially have bus networks which overlay on top of rail, um, which kind of duplicate rail. Um, and, and then you can see cities do what we have in the middle or on the right, where you really have the two networks complement each other. Either you can have the bus routes feed into a rail line, or you can have the bus routes turn into cross towns that cross the rail line and keep going to somewhere else. And you can really see that kind of difference in system typology. Here's Denver, for example. Um, where you can see the, the bus and rail network are nearly independent. Um, they're obviously, they've terminated bus routes at rail stations, but if you think about where the major travel flows are, most of those bus riders are actually using the bus for, a, for most of their trip or all of their trip. Um, whereas if you compare to Houston, where you can see how much more interconnectivity there is and how much these rail lines sort of are the strong desire lines that mean that these bus routes are are feeding people into rail to get them into downtown um, and there's distinct ridership differences i would argue that in the united states we've often actually put rail in the places where we need it the least um, here you can see denver for example the the bus on colfax carrying 22,000 riders a day similar length of light rail on the southern end of the system carrying only 8,000 simply because it serves so many fewer people around it. Um, and so that's a major capital investment going into a place where it benefits fewer people at the same time that that really high ridership route on Colfax is as of now um, still stuck in traffic. Luckily, Denver is doing a BRT project on Colfax, which will help that, but even still not the same level of capital investment that, that um, much lower ridership light rail line got. I would argue that what rail does well is carry lots of people, which means intuitively we ought to put it where the most people are riding. And if you look at Vancouver, for example, they are building a subway under Broadway in what is the highest ridership bus route in North America, places where they're running headways like every two minutes at rush hour and still leaving people behind because the buses are so full. That's exactly the place where it, makes sure, where it makes sense to spend money for extra capacity. And I am seeing more and more cities do that. Austin's transit plan, for example, really focuses rail and BRT in the core of the city where the greatest population density is, where the greatest pop density of jobs is, and in a way that complements, that strengthens the bus network around it. And these successful rail lines are also lines that serve lots of different kinds of trips. Part of what makes New York's transit network so great is it doesn't just get you to work, it gets you to everything else you want to do. Uh, it gets you to the hospital, it gets you to school, it gets you to baseball, it gets you to museums, it gets you to the park, it gets you to shopping. Um, and that's what the successful systems do. And, and you can see at the bottom of this list, some of these very single purpose systems that don't do that. In addition to building new spine lines like these, we also need to make our legacy transit systems better. Often these are the systems that are carrying the highest loads, um, but often they're not very good quality systems. This is the New York subway, for example, um, far and away the highest ridership transit system in North America. Um, but when you look at that on the right, those green dots are stations that are wheelchair accessible? The red dots are stations that are not. If you are in a wheelchair, um, only a small portion of that system is accessible to you, and your experience of riding transit in New York is much more limited. Chicago, on the left by comparison, has done much better in upgrading its stations to be accessible. They still have a ways to go, though, and need to continue focusing on that. Um, so if you think about what should a heavy rail system look like? It should be fully accessible. It should have open gangways in the train so you can move easily from one car to another, which actually helps those trains carry larger loads. We should have platform edge doors so you can't fall onto the tracks at a station. And we should be moving towards automating these trains, which allows much more frequent service. Um, similarly, if we've got a streetcar system or a light rail system, we should be doing proof of payment. We should be doing level boarding. We should have dedicated lanes. We should have quality stations. 
lines. You're seeing, for example, MBTA in Boston upgrade their green line and what they call green line transformation to really look a lot more like this. And, and other cities that have legacy streetcar systems really ought to be doing the same. Got bus stations and, and bus networks. And, dedicated lanes, really high quality stations. We should be doing all door boarding rather than having everybody pay the driver because that makes that service so much faster. We should have much better passenger information. And this applies to commuter rail as well. State of the art commuter rail, it's electrified, which allows for um, not just a lower carbon footprint, but faster service. Um, level boarding, so you just get right on and off the train, whether you're in a wheelchair or lugging a suitcase, that still applies. Um, integration with local transit, things like free transfers to the bus and to, to streetcars and subway systems. Proof of payment, rather than having fares collected on board by a conductor and frequent show up and go service. Um, and that's something where I would point out Maryland has a real opportunity there. Um, I mean, Mark could be a very different kind of service. You've got large parts of the system, which are essentially very peak hour focused. You know, if you're trying to get to and from Frederick, Maryland, then it's really only will take you in one direction at one time of day. Um, but there's really demand there all day. Um, and if you think especially about the Northeast Corridor um, and the Penn Line and then also the Camden Line, they're connecting to major centers of activity in Baltimore and DC. There is all day demand there. There's lots of opportunity to link to bus routes all the way along the way. Those lines should be frequent um, and those lines should be a lot easier to use. Everything I said about service also applies to the suburbs. We really need to expand our high quality transit beyond the pre-World War II urban cores. We know how to serve downtowns. Um, we know how to serve major medical areas. We know how to serve universities. Um, and we know how to serve our sort of um, pre, uh, our sort of pre-World War II streetcar suburbs. Um, but if you look at where people are, if you look at where density is, a lot of that is in things like 1970s apartment complexes. Um, and what we have seen over time is that low income residents have moved further and further out from the core and frankly, cities have grown. Um, and our transit systems are often not serving that well. We have places where people really need high quality transit and we're not providing it. Um, and this isn't about suburban transit as a fast service to a downtown. This isn't about just following where the freight rail lines happen to be and going out to the suburbs as quickly as possible. Um, what it is about is actually service that serves all kinds of trips in that area. Um, and um, that also means we need to think about what kind of transit-oriented development we actually have um, in our suburban areas. We need to have TOD, which actually feeds more people into transit, which is actually useful to transit. Simply building next to transit is not good enough. Um, so we've seen good examples of this. We've seen examples like BRT in a suburban employment center in Houston. We've seen um, examples across the country, but I'd point to the best one out there is Vancouver, um, a, a city which has probably transformed itself around transit more than any other city in North America. Um, you can, where you can see clusters of high rises scattered around, um, where you can see clusters of high rises scattered around um, the major um, transit stations. Um, and the redevelopment of single story strip retail and single family surrounded by single family neighborhoods into 15 and then 30 story towers, um, not just at one station, but at station after station and really integrated with all of the needs of daily life. Um, so that for example, um, you have this Safeway store directly at the station um, so that you can, um, you can get your groceries immediately as you get off the train. Um, DC actually has some good examples of this. I'd say DC Metro Rail is, is an example of a system which has really done a good job of serving those kind of suburban employment centers. And you see that in the ridership. Um, and 
there's a lot more opportunities to do that. The purple line, for example, does exactly that. But it's not just about the suburbs, it's about inner city networks that connect to other places. We need better connections between our cities and to our small towns. Um, if you look at our rail networks, um, you can see there are some places where we have good service, Washington, New York, obviously, but we see a lot of intercity corridors where the, there's a huge amount of demand and the service simply isn't there. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities for that, including integrating commuter rail with Amtrak service like they have on the Hartford line. Um, and this isn't just about trains, it's about how we use trains and buses together. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to do express bus service on um, major freeways to provide those kind of links. And we should also be thinking about rural transit. There are some states like New Mexico that do a really good job of actually tying rural areas and small towns to the transit network. The need is there, and even a couple of buses a day can make a huge difference there. And then when we've done all of that, we need to actually integrate these networks. We need to create seamless connections that tie bus and rail together. Um, and we can do that in lots of ways. It's, it's about the physical connections. Um, what, how do I get from that bus to the train? How comfortable is that connection? Um, and, and you can see examples like Toronto, where um, you can see at rail station after rail station, buses actually pulling directly into the paid fare zone um, for really easy connections. Um, in this case, even streetcars and buses running underground into the subway station so that when it's raining or snowing, you can make that transfer very easily. Um, and the result of that is that the entire bus network can benefit from those connections. Um, we've seen other places do that. Salt Lake City, for example, has some really nice bus um, commuter rail integration. Um, and the... Um, um, and there's also some really good examples abroad. This is Munich, for example, um, where we can see a really beautiful integration of light rail buses at a subway station, all under one roof, all with great wayfinding and all with integrated fares. As this isn't just about the physical form, this is about things like how do we collect fares and how do we do transfers? I'd argue the perfect fare system is the same fare from point A to B, regardless of what mode you use, regardless of what agency you're on, regardless of how many transfers you make. Um, and that means we need to think about integration. We need to think about how different agencies work together. There's lots of ways to do that. Um, and we also have to confront some of the political realities of this, realize that sometimes we have separate agencies because of things like here in Atlanta, um, the, the sort of historic racism where suburban areas have wanted different agencies than um, what they perceive as the black urban core. Um, and we have to be willing to have those discussions and, and we have to be willing to take that on if we want to have better transit networks. And then finally, we need to make these um, systems more legible. Um, so we need to make transit easy to understand and use. Um, that's things like branding. Uh, I love the Velocirafta in, in Colorado with the Roaring Fork Transit Authority. Um, it is things like effective maps, um, SEPTA embarking on a wayfinding and mapping program to really integrate the entire network that it inherited from multiple different transit operators. Um, it's things like what we do at stations. Um, this, the A-line in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where you've got all of the information you need, information on fares, you've got a full map, you've got a full timetable, you've got real-time bus arrival information. Um, you've got a sign that tells you which way the bus is going, something most bus stops in the United States don't tell you, and you've got a name for that station. It also means looking at the underlying network structures. Um, so that, for example, um, this is a section of St. Paul. Every color represents a different bus route number. Um, and every one of those um, lines is actually a different version of that bus route. Um, this is the kind of system that works for you if you ride it at the same time every day to the same destination. But for a first time rider, for somebody who's making a different trip every day, the system simply will not work for you. I'd say that underlines to me what the whole premise of all of this is. I think we spend way too much time talking about trains and buses 
and not enough time thinking about the people who use them. And if we really think about how to make transit useful to people, we can have better transit networks everywhere. Um, and with that, I want to make sure to finish in plenty of time so we can do some good Q&A. Um, you can see my contact information up here. Definitely, if you find this interesting, follow me on Twitter at, at Christoph Spieler. Um, and we have the code. You can go to islandpress.org and get 30% off the book. And with that, I'm looking forward to the questions. Great. Thank you, Christoph. And we'll have you turn your camera on here uh, for the Q&A. And thank everybody who's already sent uh, some questions in. We've gotten a number of them already, and you can continue to ask them through the questions tab on the control panel uh, throughout uh, the rest of the period, which is about 45 minutes for questions. So thank you, Christoph. Um, this will start here with a question from Rick Rybeck, who is uh, saying, where transit provides a valuable service, it enhances nearby land values. If service Proves or fares are reduced, service improves or fares are reduced, land values and rents go up even more. Which transit systems utilize land value return and recycling as part of their revenue stream? So the, the idea of um, the idea of using land value to help fund transit has been around for a while. In fact, it's been around for a very long time. If you go all the way back to streetcar lines in the 1920s, a lot of times those streetcars were built by developers who actually made their money not on operating the streetcars, but on, um, on selling the houses that were around it. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's a good idea. And, and you have seen projects like, for example, um, the BRT line I showed in Houston was actually funded through tax increment on the surrounding areas. Um, I do think there's limitations to that. Um, I don't think we should make good transit contingent on there being new development or be there being increases in property value because that in itself can be a real equity problem. Um, we, we don't want to essentially budget transit based on it gentrifying. Um, and the other thing I think that's also sort of worth thinking about here is that transit is basic infrastructure. We don't do the same thinking for a street. We don't say if you're going to repave your street, we're going to put a specific tax on the areas around it. Um, so I think land value capture is actually a really useful tool. Uh, I think development on top of stations is an amazing thing because it can allow more people to live and work next to transit. Um, but um, I think we have to think very carefully about where we use that tool and how we use it. Great, okay, thanks, Christoph. Next question here is from Sean Gillis, who asks, how do cities and agencies do a better job focusing on quality transit versus symbolic transit or niche transit? And what agencies or cities are good examples of this? I think this is a really good point. And I think it goes to the basic question of what are our goals with building transit? You can definitely see some transit projects where the fundamental goals weren't ridership. Um, the, the fundamental goal was politicians like ribbon cutting. The fundamental goal was um, we want to create jobs um, through, through a construction project, or the fundamental goal was we want to stimulate development around the transit. I think part of what we need to do is actually have conversations about the goals of what our transit projects are for. What are we trying to accomplish with this project that we are doing? Um, so that's point number one. I think the second is we need to have a lot more conversations about service. Um, you know, in doing the research for the book, I've I've had to look at lots of other um, I've had to look at lots of other agencies across the country and and look at their proposed transit projects. And what's interesting is oftentimes they'll give you all of the details of here's where the station's going, here's where the tracks are going, but won't tell you anything about the level of service that will operate on that project. That level of service is actually what people are going to experience. Um, transit is not measured in miles of track or cubic yards of concrete. It's, it's measured in where does it get you and how often does it go and how long will it take you? Um, so I think when we have transit discussions, we need to have a lot more of that service discussion. And I think part of the reason we don't 
is it's actually harder to understand, especially for non-transit riders. When we're doing transit, we're inevitably dealing with decision makers who do not ride transit themselves. And, and I think the infrastructure is easier to understand than the service, um, which I think puts the onus on all of us who plan transit, whether we're consultants or work at agencies or work for elected officials, to actually figure out how to tell this story. Um, to figure out how to talk about service and talk about what transit will actually mean to people. Um, and the better we can do that, the better the transit we'll build is. Thanks, Christoph. Um, we've got a couple comments about your discussion about uh, Vancouver. And here's one from Phil Carlson who says, is it fair to compare Vancouver to other cities? Vancouver is essentially a landlocked island, whereas most other cities spread out in all directions. Maybe a better comparison is how much of the geography of a given city has at least 60% service by transit. I mean, Vancouver is what it is partially as a result of geography, but also as a result of decisions that they've made. Uh, I mean, they, they, they have decided where to build. And, and like I said, the level of redevelopment they have is something that a lot of other places could have done but haven't. Um, and I can point to US cities that have similar geographic barriers that don't have nearly as good a transit network. Um, so obviously geography makes a difference. The, the San Francisco's and New York's of the world, which are have cores that are surrounded by strong geographic bounds, will tend to have land use patterns that are somewhat more transit friendly. Um, but Vancouver's land use pattern didn't start this way. It, 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 the, the places that I'm showing here are not places which started as transit-oriented places. They're, they're, they're places that have been transformed. And, and I believe strongly that, that every transit planner in the United States ought to make it to Vancouver and see what that's actually like. Um, because I think it is like, this is something that would be possible in a lot of other places. Um, and, and one of the, the things that, I really want to get across in the book is, is how much these things are universal, um, how much this isn't, um, there's things that are different between cities. Obviously there's things that are unique in every city, but I think we have way too much of a tendency to think that every place is, is unique. I mean, we obviously see it with New York transit. Like every time I have a Twitter discussion about through running at Penn Station or, or any time you have these discussions about transit construction costs, the people in New York City sort of inevitably say, well, we're different than every place else. And the answer is like, no, you're not. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously other places don't have the Statue of Liberty, but the the land use patterns of New York City, the transit needs of New York City, you can find lots of parallels across the United States, even across the world, um, and lots of good ideas from elsewhere. Um, and, and so I think we should always resist that tendency to, to say we're different. Um, I mean, we should also resist the tendency to, to call a place car oriented and, and treat as if that's like a fundamental unchangeable truth. Um, I mean, a lot of people point to Houston and say, you know, Houston is fundamentally a car city. Um, but what's interesting is we have some very successful park and ride bus service. We have very successful light rail lines. Um, I think there's a lot more potential for improved transit than people think. Um, and, and cities can change and, and transit can be part of that. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Next question here is from uh, Brian Ditzler who's saying, is there any data on how much economic development results from adjacency to BRT versus light and heavy rail? Uh, this is this is a, a question I have heard many times, um, which basically there, there's, we definitely know that rail transit lines can support, lead to more development around them. We have not built enough BRT in the United States to really know whether BRT is the same. My intuition is that I don't really see why it would be different if it is of the same quality. That, that I think that when people use transit, the question they're asking in their head is not, is it steel wheels on steel rails or rubber tires on concrete? It's how quickly will it get me there? Does it go where I need to go? Is it is it fast? Is it reliable? And, and that, if we do a BRT system which meets those needs, I think that will shape people's travel behaviors. It 
will shape where people want to live and work, and therefore it will shape development. Um, but we don't have a big enough fact base in the United States yet to be clear about that. You have places like Cleveland that, that can show there has been a lot of development around BRT. But the thing about development is in every place, we can always have the argument of how much of it was attributed to that and how much of it wasn't. Um, I think we can clearly say that a rail line does more to promote development than a local bus in mixed traffic. Um, but I don't think the difference there is that one is a train, one's a bus. I think the difference is the quality of the service. Great, thanks, Christoph. Okay, next question here is from Allison Lewis, who says, I'm a planner working on a road redesign. During the schematic design phase, we discussed a designated bus lane, but received feedback that there isn't enough bus volume to support this. An argument could be made that a designated bus lane would allow for more frequent and higher quality bus service that might promote an increase in ridership. Do you have any suggestions on a solution that supports an efficient bus network besides a designated lane? The intention being once bus ridership increases along the corridor, the city will eventually designate a lane. I mean, there is no substitute for a dedicated transit lane in places that are congested. Now, if you don't have a high level of congestion, we're in a different discussion. But if it's congested, yeah, transit signal priority can do some good. It will not do the same that a dedicated lane does. I, I think that the sort of discussion you seem to be trapped in, um, I mean, the, the best way I've heard to put that is essentially, we, we don't estimate how many people will use a bridge by counting how many people swim across the river. Um, that we know that if we provide better transit, the ridership numbers will be significantly different. Um, so I think absolutely think it makes sense to provide a dedicated bus lane and provide more frequent service in a place where we think the underlying demand is there, whether it's there now or whether that's a new development that's coming in. Um, because we've got lots of examples of the ridership can be there for that. Um, and a dedicated lane helps with capacity, but I would argue it's not fundamentally about capacity. The argument for dedicated lanes is speed and reliability. And if we want to make transit more useful to more people, we have to make it faster and more reliable. Um, and in a way, and in, I, I you can think of the analog, for example, to, to the interstate highway system. Uh, all interstate highways are grade separated. All interstate highways have at least two lanes in every direction. And there's plenty of places where you kind of made the argument, hey, the traffic that was here before we built an interstate wasn't high enough. So why don't we just have a traffic signal on it? But no, the highway engineers, state DOTs, federal DOT said, this is our minimum standard and this is what we're doing. And, and I think we need to be more willing to do that with transit. Okay, thank you. Next question here is from Travis Pollack, who's asking, um, there's a growing debate on eliminating fares for transit. How do fares or fare free fit with, with what makes a successful transit system? Yeah, so I'd say, one place to start that discussion is let's talk about what fares are actually for. Um, and actually, it's kind of surprising to ask that question because it, it, it seems like a very basic question, but I, I have found very few transit agencies actually articulate the purpose of fares. Um, in some agencies, um, the answer is fares are there to fund service. You have agencies which get a significant portion of their operating budget from fares. New York City is an example of that. A lot of the higher ridership areas and that systems like BART and commuter rail systems, you often see some, some really high fare box recovery. So the answer there is we're charging fares in order to pay for this. Um, other systems have much lower fare box recovery. In fact, I would argue there's quite a few smaller and suburban transit systems in the United States where the overall cost of collecting fares exceeds the amount of revenue you get from them. Um, because collecting fares, you need fare boxes, um, you need the whole sort of capacity of collecting that money and sorting that money. And um, you also are going to run all of your routes a little slower because the time it takes for that driver to collect that fare is more time in your schedule. Um, and so I think 
there's definitely a lot of agencies out there for whom money is not the primary reason. And, and it turns out, you know, there's other reasons that I think a lot of them are political. There, there are things like we don't want transit to feel like a giveaway and, and we sort of have some policy feeling that, that the riders should pay some share of it. Um, I think we should really question things like that and, and say, does that actually make sense? Um, and there's real benefits to free transit. Obviously, it, it, it removes the cost as a barrier to people using it, but it also just remove fares as a barrier that that oftentimes I, I mean when i ride transit i often find figuring out how i'm going to pay can be a real issue not everybody carries coins for everything every system has a different smartphone app a different fare structure you have to understand a different way of paying you have to understand like like just the hassle of fares can actually be an impediment to riding um and so i think there's good reasons to consider fare free that said on systems where there is meaningful fare box recovering, the meaningful portion of the operating cost of the system is borne by those fares. And even if that's 15 or 20%, I think we have to ask the question, whatever funds we have to replace that money, what else could those funds have done? And what you find when you actually talk to transit riders the cost of transit is not the biggest obstacle. It's the quality of service that's actually the obstacle. So if we have a choice between using that money to do free fares or using that money to provide frequent service, I would argue it's almost always better used to provide frequent service, that we will actually help people more by getting them where they need to go when they need to go than by saving them a dollar or two. Um, so I think that's the analysis we need to do. Um, Ideally, we'd have the funding to do both of them, in which case, great, but but if the funding's not there to do both of them, we should be asking, what is the best use of those dollars? Great, thank you, Christoph, and thanks to everybody who's sending questions in. We're getting a good number of them in, and you can continue to submit. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about spine rail and especially achieving what FTA sometimes now calls hybrid rail as opposed to commuter rail, more frequent all-day service, but maybe not able to get to 15-minute frequency, but perhaps 20-minute frequency or three trains per hour, particularly where you have to share tracks with freight and intra-city rail? Yeah. A lot of things buried in that question. I mean, I think it's, if you look at, you know, let's, let's look narrowly at commuter rail here. If you look at commuter rail systems in the United States, we've got some systems that are literally peak hour only. Um, we've got some systems, um, we've got some systems that are very infrequent in the middle of the day, a train every two or three hours. We've got systems that don't run at all on weekends. Simply going from a train every two or three hours or no train at all to a train every hour is already a significant improvement. It already means there's more people for whom that's useful. Span of service, having an 11 p.m. I was in Los Angeles riding from downtown LA to Irvine, last train of the day is just after 6 p.m. Now, if you got to work late, suddenly that service isn't there for you. So, you know, having the last train of the day at 11 as opposed to six makes a huge difference. So, so sort of every increment of service we add makes a difference. Um, I also think it can make a real difference to make schedules simpler and easier to understand. Things like headway schedules, the train leaves at five after every hour. Um, and things like stopping patterns, being very simple. Um, if you look at US commuter rail systems, the schedules are often enormously complicated. And you know, most trains stop at this station, only a few trains stop at that station. Again, if you're trying to figure out a system like that, there's a decent chance that you're gonna end up like accidentally bypassing the station you were trying to get to. So the simpler we make those schedules, um, the more usable it is as well. But going beyond that, I, I think if you look at the footprints of a lot of US commuter rail systems, definitely in New York, definitely in Boston, definitely in Philly, definitely in Baltimore, definitely in Chicago, but places like um, Seattle and Los Angeles as well, and definitely Caltrain, San Francisco, like there we have commuter rail lines 
that serve areas with a level of density and a level of demand that can definitely justify 15 minute service or you know 20 minute service but i'd say there's a big difference between 15 and 20 10 is even better um and we operate very little of that. The, the only commuter rail line in the United States that actually meets the 15 minute threshold is in Denver, um, from downtown Denver to the airport. Nothing in New York City, nothing in New Jersey actually is that frequent. Um, and there's a lot of demand, not just for those long trips, but for short trips within those areas, the kind of trips that we would be serving if that were light rail or, or a subway system. And beyond that, I also think there's a lot of potential to integrate that I think if you look at these systems, these stations could be bus hubs. If you ride an S-Bahn in Germany, what you see is that stop after stop, that rail station is the hub of the suburban bus system. And when a train pulls in a couple minutes later, buses pull out in all sorts of directions. And, and you can really redesign an entire transit network around that if you really fully integrate the modes. And that means even more ridership because the people who aren't immediately next to the stations also benefit from it. Um, so we can map out a lot of places where, where 15 minute service um, makes sense. Now, what are the restrictions? Things like single track, things like junctions can definitely be bottlenecks and places where we are sharing track with freight can definitely be a bottleneck. So in some places, 15 minute service can actually be quite expensive. Um, but there are other places where we don't have those problems. Big chunks of our Northeastern commuter rail networks are not sharing track with freight. They may be sharing track with Amtrak, but frankly, Amtrak trains and MARC trains are pretty darn compatible if we can, can get different agencies working together. Um, We've got places where we've got quadruple track main lines and we're not offering frequent service. The, the, the capacity is there. And we've got places where relatively minor infrastructure upgrades, you know, improvements at one or two junctions can make a big difference. Um, so I think that the frequent service in places where the density there should be the aspiration. Um, what we should be doing in all of these places is asking what will it take to get there? And I think we'll find some places, the infrastructure is already there, some places there's only minor levels of infrastructure improvement needed. Other places are a much bigger lift. Um, one of the points I also make is that I think we often tend to sort of focus first on the infrastructure rather than getting clever about the service. One of the other, the, the most frequent commuter rail line North America is actually in Ottawa. And that was operating on a single track line with passing sidings. Um, where the schedule was planned precisely around the locations of those passing sidings. So basically at every siding, you'd have a meet between two trains, like a fully optimized version of that infrastructure. And I think often we don't do that. We, we start by saying we have to build a bunch of stuff rather than asking how can we use smart scheduling and smart organization to provide better service. Okay, thanks, Christoph. Um, next question here is from uh, Drew Merrill, who's asking, have you studied the effects of stop accessibility, such as sidewalks and ADA ramps on ridership and equity? Oh, it's huge. Um, it, it's again, one of those things where it's kind of hard to find numbers, but Houston, for example, just installing a bus shelter led to an immediate ridership boost at that stop. Um, and like I said, transit trips are door-to-door -door trips. They, they, they're not bus stop to bus stop trips. Um, and so if we care about transit, we need to care about sidewalks. And, and sidewalks are the best last mile technology ever invented. No autonomous circulator will ever beat a sidewalk in terms of, of getting people to transit. And sidewalks are also great because they are low capital cost. And unlike you know, that autonomous circulator, um, there's no operating cost associated. We ought to be spending a lot more time building good sidewalks. We also incidentally need to build crosswalks. I would argue a crosswalk is, is part of the basic infrastructure of a bus stop. Every bus stop ought to have an associated crosswalk because the fact is nearly everybody using that stop will have to cross the street either on their trip there or their trip back. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is basic stuff and we know, we know that good pedestrian infrastructure will increase ridership. It's hard to model, it's hard to predict, but we know that when we do it, it's there. From an accessibility standpoint, for somebody in a wheelchair, for example, if we can give somebody who's in a wheelchair access to frequent fixed route service rather than being dependent on dial-a-ride, 
because now there's a sidewalk from their house two blocks to the bus stop. Like we have just made somebody's life extraordinarily better um, uh, of being able to just travel when they want to rather than having to reserve a trip. Um, and from an equity standpoint, obviously, if you look at US cities, um, like walkability isn't for yuppies and hipsters. The, the, the people who are walking in cities are heavily low income, heavily people of color. Um, and so, again, those sidewalk investments are some of the best equity investments we can make. And one good way to think about it is, if I am spending money on a sidewalk or I'm spending money on a park and ride stop, I will actually help more people with that same money invested in the sidewalk in most cases than I will by investing that money in a parking space. And the people I will serve will also be a much more representative cross-section of the region than that park and ride lot will be. Yeah, Thanks, Christoph. Here's a related question, I guess. Uh, how would you respond to those who say that they want to make sure that the disabled and vulnerable seniors can get around, and that's only by cars? I mean, it is very unfortunate that we have built lots of places where people who are disabled or, or senior citizens can really only get around by car. And I'm very sympathetic to that. Like we've made a bunch of bad urban planning decisions because that is not a good outcome. And, and we have a lot of people in the United States who are effectively semi-stranded in their homes because driving is the only option. And once they're at a point where they can't drive anymore, they're stuck. Um, so first of all, we ought to be building places that are not car dependent simply to give everybody that freedom, whether they're able to drive or not. Um, and realize that aging in place, like having, having alternatives to driving is a huge part of that. Secondly, I mean, in reality, show me where there are proposals which would make it impossible for people who are disabled or, or, or people who or, or senior citizens who have mobility impairments where it makes them impossible for them. We're not doing that. I mean, even in places where there's proposals for pedestrian malls, um, you know, that's just one block. There's still car access on all the other sides. Um, and whenever like these are parking fights, I, I think people are using the disabled as cover. You know, like like Whenever you have a neighborhood pushing back saying you are eliminating on-street parking because of a bus lane and this will hurt the say If you were to come back and say to them, what if we make all of these parking spots ADA spots only? I bet they would push back just as hard um, because they're really using that argument. They're giving that lip service as a way for their own convenience. And, and we don't owe everybody a parking space on the street. That, that's public space that we can use in lots of different ways. Um, but I think this is a conversation that's really important to have. And I actually think that in a lot of case, transit advocates have not talked to advocates for, the se for seniors and, and for people with disabilities nearly enough. A and we need to build coalitions here. And, and we really need to realize that there's important needs we do need to take care of. And I, I think with good street design, with good urban planning, we can actually take care of all of those needs. Thanks, Christoph. Here's a little different type of question. Uh, what is on your wish list for how local governments and MPOs spend their funds from the new federal infrastructure bill? <laughs> oh, this is a really fun one. Um, I mean, don't build stupid projects, first of all. Like, I, I always get worried about the shovel-ready discussion. Like, you know, this project has been in the work, has been in the plans for 20 years. If a project's been in the plans for 20 years and never been built, that might be a sign it's actually a bad project. Um, and I think on the roadway side, I would say, don't just keep expanding when you have real maintenance and safety issues. Like, target funds on rebuilding infrastructure that's falling apart, target funds on places where you have safety issues, rather than just adding more lane miles to a network. Um, so I, I, I think where we spend money, what kind of projects we choose is incredibly important. It is also noteworthy that many of the funds that we call highway funds are not actually highway funds. They're, they're flexible federal funds that can be used for all sorts of modes of transportation. Um, and so states could be taking that money and, and flexing it to 
a new transit line. They could be flexing that money to sidewalk improvements. They could be flexing that money to new bike lanes. And we ought to be doing a lot more of that. Um, I found that often at MPOs, the language around this money is, is almost purposefully um, non-transparent. Um, that there are a lot of decisions being made locally that are being represented as if they are federal decisions. The federal government actually gives you quite a bit of leeway in how you spend this money. Um, I'd also say on the transit side, I mean, focus where it benefits to most people. And I love projects that actually reduce operating costs. Something like a bus lane, something like converting a really high ridership bus route to rail can end you up with a system that can carry more people for less operating cost um, than the system it replaced. And that's great because that will help you year in and year out. And don't just look for the big projects. A, a project which builds a BRT line or a rail line is great. A project which builds a thousand bus stops is also a great project. Um, and I think we need to identify those and transit agencies should really be thinking about, you know, if we have money, well, wh what can we do to really make people's lives better? And I think almost any agency can find a wide range of projects. Um, and some of those are customer facing. Some of those are very basic things like building new bus garages so that you can continue to maintain the fleet. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities there for creative thinking. And this is going to be one of those rare moments where there's a lot of dollars available. And it's really up to every metro area to, to be smart about how those spend those. And there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration. There's a lot of opportunities for cities and transit agencies to work together. There's a lot of opportunity for multi-purpose projects, for projects which include roadway and transit together um, for projects which integrate transit and, and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, so I hope people get creative and I hope people really prioritize intelligently. Okay, thank you, good advice. Um, next question here is from Mary Anderson who says, what advice or best practices do you have for small urban agencies that don't yet have BRT but future population growth may warrant it within the next five to 10 years. So, I mean, one thing is planning in advance is great. Um, one of the best things a transit agency or a city can do is say, these are the corridors we're aiming towards and everything we do in these corridors should support that. If we're gonna rebuild a section of the street, let's go ahead and build that BRT footprint into it. If there's going to be a new development, let's think about how that development works with a future station. Um, so I think there's lots of great opportunities to, to sort of incrementally build towards these future projects and make sure that, that we're designing our cities to work for them. And, and that includes land use, you know, if you're doing zoning, Start up zoning around those corridors. Start start encouraging new development around those corridors. Start changing your parking ordinances around those corridors. Um, the other thing is, do you think it's a future BRT corridor? It's probably a current frequent bus corridor. Um, and starting to upgrade the service that operates there, starting to do basic things like wayfinding and and better better branding can start getting you towards the road of building the ridership that you are looking for to do that BRT corridor. And finally, I would ask the basic question of, is it really five years away? Um, because I think there's an awful lot of places which could justify that today. I mean, Fort Collins, Colorado has very nice BRT. Um, this isn't just something that really dense corridors and really big cities are. I, I think there's lots of corridors in the United States where BRT makes sense today. and you know, you've got one of those corridors, do it today. There, there's no reason to say this is our 10 year long range plan. Okay, thank you. I have about uh, 12 minutes or so more for questions and thanks to everybody who's sending them in. We've got more than we'll probably have time for today. Our next question here is from Steve Mahowald who's asking, are you aware of, of any ridership data that supports moving to clocked headways as compared to constantly adjusting the schedule to accurately re reflect running time? What I can say is that some of the highest ridership transit cities in the world use clock face headways. So, so idea of clock face headways, 
um, basically have the schedule be the same every hour, have trains come exactly every 60 or every 30 or every 15 or every 10, so that you can literally memorize that schedule. Um, from a transit planning standpoint, it's actually quite nice. It makes it simpler to plan a system. From a passenger standpoint, it's wonderful because it makes it really easy to understand. You know, you know there's a train at 23 after and you know there's a train at 53 after. And if you live there, you just remember that in a way that you would not be able to remember. Like there's a 213 train and then there's a 270, there's a, you know, two. 227 train and then there's a 305 like you're not going to remember that um the other thing that is really great about clock face headways is they allow you to to set up time transfers between different routes well that you know if you're if your train runs every hour and the local bus network pulses every hour you can line those up and, and it's really e easy to to coordinate across modes and across agencies why don't we do this? I mean, one reason for it is frankly that often this planning is not customer centered, it's not rider centric. We're not thinking about what will be easier for the riders. Um, but there's lots of reasons why agencies don't. Um, and the biggest is fundamentally economic constraints um, that you are seeing agencies try to save every operating dollar they can. Um, and, you know, the length of the route's a little longer. It might be a lot less expensive to run a bus every 35 minutes than every 30, because that 35 just turns out to be a really efficient use of, of vehicles. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're running every 10 minutes and one of those buses isn't very full every day, you're starting to say, we've got to cut some service somewhere because, you know, we've got operating cuts this year because our tax didn't come in as much as we thought. Um, you're probably going to cut one of those buses and say, you know, not a lot of people are riding this. So there's a tendency for systems to just get more complicated because of the reality of scheduling networks. And, and one of the things I, for example, concluded in looking at the Boston Bus Network is the Boston Bus Network is too efficient. Some really smart people have utterly optimized that network. Um, and that means that you know, it's doing an amazing job of spreading those resources a long way, but it's also a much more difficult network to use. Um, and so if we really want to take clock face headway seriously, that direction has to come from policymakers, that the direction has to come from leadership that says, we are not expecting you to, to sort of hyper optimize for every dollar of operating cost, we believe that there is this principle that if you make service easy to understand, more people will ride it. Um, and I deeply believe that is the case, um, but it's a change in how we think about transit and how we think about planning transit. And, it, and it's sort of a move away from a scarcity mentality. Um, and it is a willingness to hold the line. If that, that bus route runs once an hour and the length of the route is right for that and somebody comes along and says we opened a new senior center you know a quarter mile down the road can you extend the route you have to be willing to say no this route will not um this route will not work properly with these headways anymore if we do that um and that's you know obviously a hard thing to do as well politically um but i actually think that that philosophy of making schedules be easy to understand it is one of the best things we could do in US transit. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, next question here is from Regina Anderson who asks, can you speak to smaller circulators that support the major lines? In Hong Kong, there are private minibuses that operate on fixed routes with no set stops. What are some of the policies in the US that prevent this kind of service? I mean, we have some of that kind of service in the United States. We have on-demand service, et cetera. Um, what I will say is it's never particularly high ridership because that isn't actually an efficient way to provide transit service. Um, it can be um, a sort of coverage safety net kind of network. Um, and I would say that often when we're providing those kind of services, it's really because we've made bad urban planning decisions. And obviously that's usually not the fault of the transit agency. Um, but fundamentally what transit does well is carry lots of people in a straight line with frequent service. Um, and 
the highest ridership, most successful transit systems are not dependent on circulators. They're not dependent on short routes. Like if, if you think of a place like London or New York City, like there's lots of people riding the subway for only a couple of stops, but there aren't lots of short subway lines. Um, that that kind of short trip function is actually the exact same trains or the exact same buses that are used to make the longer trips. The, the, the most efficient circulator is actually just a subset of a longer transit line. Um, and that's how we should do planning. I, th I think in a lot of US cities that the reason we end up with, you know, these downtown trolley circulators is, is that we are again micro targeting something. We're saying, you know, there's, you know, we want some way for people to get from their office building to lunch. Um, and then inventing a transit route just for that reason. Well, I mean, here in Houston, we've had them, but if you look at downtown Houston, that the transit that people use by far the most to get from their office building to lunch is the light rail line, um, which is also the one that people are using to get five miles away. Um, because it is so frequent, because it is so convenient, it actually works really well for those short trips. Um, so that I think oftentimes when we're talking about a circulator, we really need to be rethinking the overall transit network, not adding another route on top of it. Um, but the kind of shuttle sort of on-demand service you described, I absolutely think that is part of how we can serve lower density areas. But again, that will not be a high ridership service. That'll be a kind of essential lifeline service which can play a really important role in the network, but it won't ever be the core of what we do. Um, and whenever you have one of those areas, we ought to be asking sort of what longer transit lines are missing, what ped bike infrastructure is missing, uh, how could we serve that need in different ways? Because it's the fact that you're thinking about that is probably an indication other things are wrong. Thanks, Christoph. We'll ask you a, a few more questions before we wrap up here. And the next question here is from Kevin Leo, who asking, um, how do we help convince policymakers to support transit that provides better coverage versus short-term ridership? I, in some ways, I don't know where the question's coming from, I'll say, because I actually think that most US transit is actually focused on coverage and not ridership. Um, that it, that it, it's the basic instinct of most elected officials and policymakers is to actually say we need to um, we need to cover as much area as possible. Um, so I would say in most cities the, the the battle is actually to try to focus a little more on ridership because we have corridors where the demand is there and we're not providing good enough service for people to actually use it. Um, but again, I think it goes back to this goals discussion. We ought to just be clear about what our goals are and, and be clear about the fact that there are trade-offs between them, that, that yes, a ridership goal and the coverage goal can be at odds with each other. And we ought to be clear as to what we're trying to accomplish. And I mean, ideally set some metrics and some goals for what we're trying to do. Um, sort of in what areas are we trying to provide uh, that kind of basic level of lifeline service? And in what areas are we trying to provide a service that is convenient enough or fast enough that, you know, that, that, that it will be genuinely, um, that it will be genuinely great and useful transit that serves lots of people. Um, we need to start this with a discussion of goals. And, and if we have a good discussion of goals, I think we can design a good network from it. Thanks, Christoph. A couple more here before we wrap. Uh, next one is from Peter Eklund, who's asking, does the availability of trip planning apps affect ridership and overall trip time? I do think that trip planning apps have made transit meaningfully easier to use um, and that there are a lot of people using them that, you know, the a lot of people have phones now. Uh, I do think transit agencies need to do a better job of getting the word out there. It surprises me how many people don't know this is available. And I wish we had less proprietary apps. Like the great thing about transit planning and something like Google Maps or even something like Transit App is that it works for everybody rather than having to have a different app for every agency. Um, and so in terms of the experience of using transit, the combination of trip planning and real-time data, I think is one of our biggest advances in actually making the customer experience better. 
I don't think it substitutes for networks which are easy to understand or use. Uh, I don't think it substitutes for a system map that helps you understand the overall structure of a network and make better decisions about how to travel around it. And I don't think it substitutes for sort of basic legibility. Um, and so, but network is so complicated, you need an app to navigate it, you're doing something wrong. Um, so I still think legibility wayfinding needs to exist on all sorts of levels, not just in an app. But I think apps have definitely made using transit easier. Great, thanks. And there's our last, qu last question here today will be from Alan Oberst, who says, thank you from Buffalo. Speaking of people, one of the people affecting things here is weather. I'm wondering how the future conversion to electric buses may create opportunities to create more indoor facilities for buses, like bus tunnels in congested areas, and places like Harvard Square, where electric buses and rail have an indoor coatless connection, and even new forms of TOD in which development can connect coatlessly to all electric transit stations. I, I love that. I love the way of. I love that coatless statement. Uh, I would say that it ought to be our goal. Transfers ought to happen under roofs. And, and in Buffalo, you may be worried about snow. In Houston, I'm worried about rain. The idea of being able to get off one bus and get onto another bus without getting wet or without getting snowed on, or even in a heated area, is amazing. Um, I do think electric buses make that easier. It does mean no fumes to deal with. Um, However, diesel buses shouldn't be an excuse. We can actually do a lot better at this, even in a diesel bus world. And I can point you to plenty of examples, like the picture I showed of in Munich, of operating diesel buses under roofs in a way that's perfectly safe, and that still provides that shelter. So I love that statement of ambition that transfers ought to happen coatlessly or, or transfers ought to happen umbrellalessly or, or ought to happen out of the elements. Um, and, and I think all transit agencies should aspire to that. And yes, I do think electric buses make it somewhat easier. Great, thanks, Christoph. We could definitely go on at least another half an hour with all the questions, um, considering how many that came in today and the more than 600 people who attended. Uh, but we'll stop here and give you an opportunity, I guess, to give us some closing thoughts and takeaways. No, I love the questions. I love the discussion. I, I think fundamentally, we need more discussions like this. Fundamentally, we need to talk about how transit works and what makes transit effective. And, and fundamentally, like I loved with that last question, we really need to talk about the rider experience and, and focus transit on what riders need. And if we do that, we'll create better transit and we'll create better cities. And, and that is the core of the book and hopefully the, the biggest takeaway from today. And I, it is so cool to have so many people show up for this discussion and, and it gives me hope for um, what will happen with US Transit. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, today, Christoph. And with that, we'll conclude our webinar today, Trains, Buses, and People, an Atlas of U.S.-Canadian Transit. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Christoph Spieler for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru who helps to make this all happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need this certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details and other future webinars. We're currently uh, planning our December programming post-Thanksgiving. So with that, I wish you all a great day.